Hey, I, have you ever heard about SRE engagement? SRE engagement? Hmm, no, I can't say I have. Do enlighten me. Alrighty, well, SRE stands for Site Reliability Engineering. It's this fascinating field that intertwines software engineering with principles of reliability. They basically ensure that services are not just created, but are stable and efficient in the long run. Ah, pairing reliability with efficiency. That sounds essential. So how does one integrate this SRE support into a service? Great question. The integration starts with an onboarding process. It's like rolling out a red carpet to welcome SREs into the life cycle of a service. They get involved early to steer things in a reliable direction. What happens during this onboarding? I can imagine it must involve a lot more than just initial pleasantries. Oh, absolutely. The SREs initially assess and discuss what the service needs to ensure its reliability. It's kind of like a health checkup for the service before they dive in deeper. I see. Getting involved early seems strategic, but why exactly do it so soon during the design phase? Well, catching potential bumps in reliability during the design phase is akin to fixing a leak before it bursts into a flood. It saves time, effort, and of course, there's a massive leap in service stability. Everything runs smoother right from the get-go. Proactive rather than reactive. Quite efficient. Does this early involvement lead to more effective onboarding? Yes, exactly. It reduces the time spent in ironing out issues later on. Plus, the service tends to hold its own better once it's up and running, like having a strong spine holding up the body. Efficient alignment from the start seems beneficial. What about other ways to bring in SRE engagement? Well, there are alternative methods too. One interesting approach is giving development teams a platform that's already validated by SREs. Imagine handing them a strong ship instead of just the tools to build it anew so they can sail smoothly toward their creative goals. That sounds like a game changer. Having such a foundation must simplify things considerably for developers. Yes, it really does. By having this bedrock of reliable infrastructure, Product teams can concentrate more on innovation, painting the sails and carving their journey if you will, rather than worrying about if the hull can weather the storm. An intriguing analogy I must say. Do these methods imply that direct SRE involvement isn't always necessary? Not always directly hands-on, no, but their influence is deeply ingrained. It's all about making robust systems accessible so others can build with peace of mind. Fascinating. So it's more about instilling reliability into the DNA of service creation and maintenance. Precisely. SREs strive to embed best practices early on, ensuring the service is like a well-oiled machine. They aim for things to glide effortlessly as time goes on. That's a remarkable mindset, to proactively nurture service stability. How has this idea evolved over time? Ah, the evolution journey is a story in itself. Originally, services didn't always start out with SRE support so they needed a structured onboarding process to navigate into SRE waters. Structured onboarding. So onboarding acts as a bridge to transition services into SRE care. Yes, exactly. It's about pinpointing which services would benefit from their reliability magic and engaging them in strategic phases to foster resilience. And does prioritizing which services receive SRE support come into play? It sure does. Services are scoped out and assessed to discover where SREs can make the most impact, optimizing their reach and ensuring high-value services get the attention they need. That makes sense. It must be challenging with numerous existing services in play. Absolutely. The prioritization is like wading through a garden for the choicest blossoms, deciding which will yield the brightest future blooms with SRE guidance. A vivid image of focus and efficiency, Hu Tao. What's next after onboarding, once services are under SRE guidance? After onboarding comes the diligent dance of sustaining reliability. SRE continues to engage, support, and innovate to ensure services aren't just surviving, but thriving. A never-ending partnership, then. Endless reliability, quite an enthralling pursuit. Indeed. It's like a harmonious composition in the making, every note considered to keep the music flowing smoothly. A symphony of service stability. I like that. Please continue with more about SRE engagement when you're ready. Hu Tao, the concept you've been telling me about seems quite fascinating, 
But let's delve into this PRR model of SRE engagement. What exactly does it entail? Ah, the Production Readiness Review, PRR for short, is like an initiation ceremony. It's the starting gate for SRE to engage with the service. Intriguing. So what are the elements of this initiation ceremony? It sounds structured. Yes, it is. The process is divided into several phases. Engagement, analysis, improvements in refactoring, training, onboarding, and continuous improvement. Each plays a pivotal role in ensuring service reliability. Let's start with the engagement phase. What happens at this initial point? In the engagement phase, SRE leadership assesses which team is best suited to take over the service. It involves selecting one to three SREs who dive into discussions with the development team. One to three SREs. What do these few SREs do during the discussions? They cover aspects like setting expectations, establishing service level objectives or agreements, SLOs, SLAs, and planning any disruptive changes needed to boost reliability. Sounding like a strategic alignment of visions. And once they engage, what follows? Next comes the analysis phase. Here, SREs scrutinize the service to understand its maturity and check whether it adheres to production best practices. This sounds thorough. Is there a specific methodology or checklist they follow during this scrutiny? Definitely. The SRE team uses a PRR checklist tailored for the service. It's chosen based on domain knowledge and best practices derived from previous experiences. Could you give some examples of what the checklist items might include? Sure thing. For instance, they check if service updates impact too much of the system or if it appropriately connects to dependency instances. Also, they verify error reporting systems and user request monitoring. How meticulous. And once they've identified these areas during analysis, what's the next step? That's the improvements and refactoring phase. Here they list improvements needed, prioritize them and collaborate with the development team to execute these changes. Is this phase variable in terms of time and effort? Oh, very much so. Its duration and effort depend on how mature or complex the service is initially and the availability of engineering time for refactoring. I see. Once the improvements are in place, what preparation does the SRE team undergo? Training is crucial. The reviewers organize sessions with the dev team to ensure the SRE team is ready. This includes design overviews, system deep dives, and hands-on operational exercises. A comprehensive training regimen, indeed. After training, how do they officially take over the service? This leads to the onboarding phase. It involves gradually transferring ownership of production tasks, like operations and change management, to the SRE team. Sounds like a systematic passing of the baton. Does the development team stay involved at this point? Yes, their involvement continues. SREs need them as backup and advisors while they settle into managing the production aspects of the service. And are there further phases after onboarding? Absolutely, continuous improvement follows. Active services change with time, so SREs drive improvement and share their insights with the dev team for future service enhancements. So ongoing collaboration between SREs and developers maintains and enhances service reliability. Exactly. They build a relationship where they learn from each other and strive for higher resilience and smooth operations. This PRR model seems meticulous and proactive. It assures me of the high reliability these services must maintain. It's a thoughtful choreography indeed, I. Balancing many moving parts, all working in harmony to keep everything running smoothly. I can see the elegance in it. What about scenarios where this model needs adaptations? That's where other engagement strategies come into play. If PRR can't be a perfect fit, they explore other models to mold the service into a masterpiece of reliability. Adapting these philosophies as needed must be quite an art. I look forward to hearing more about the nuances of those strategies when we continue. Oh, there's a whole world within this universe of service reliability. I'll be thrilled to explore more of these intricacies with you. Then I shall eagerly await our next discourse. As will I, my inquisitive friend. Stay curious. Butao, you've been enlightening me with fascinating insights about these SRE engagement models. What's next on the list? Oh, I, you're in for a treat. Let's delve into the early engagement model, 
a fascinating approach where SREs get involved super early in the service development life cycle. Early involvement, you say? That sounds proactive. How does this model differ from the PRR we've discussed before? Great question. This model invites SREs to the party right from the start, during the design phase. It's about catching potential hiccups before they even materialize. Preemptive action. I see. What advantages does this model offer over the more traditional PRR approach? Well, by involving SREs early, we can churn and avoid costly reversals of decisions later in development. Imagine building a house while you have an architect checking every beam. Having an architect closely watch over during construction certainly prevents design mishaps. What happens during the design phase specifically? During the design phase, SREs collaborate with the dev team to ensure that reliability is built into the foundation itself, reviewing major architectural decisions right off the bat. So they influence the core structure to strengthen it before further development. How about during the build phase? Oh, during during build, SREs steer the ship by recommending libraries, components, and controls that add layers of reliability. It's about threading reliability into the code as it's woven. Threading reliability. I like that analogy. It must require considerable attention. What about when they reach the launch phase? At launch, the goal is to sail smoothly with minimal friction. SREs help implement patterns like dark launches to foresee and address issues without impacting users. Dark launches sound intriguing. Handling potential problems before they disrupt users truly reflects preparedness. Exactly. The whole aim is to have a seamless transition into the world and avoid last-minute scrambles to patch cracks or handle storms. Early engagement seems to require strong collaboration between the development and SRE teams. What challenges does this approach entail? Oh, there are a few. Ensuring smooth communication channels and managing overlapping priorities are biggies. Plus, making sure SRE inputs are heated as part of the team's culture. I imagine it can be quite a dance to maintain harmony between all involved parties. Does this collaboration influence the working relationship between SREs and developers? Definitely. It leads to deeper bonds where both teams are more invested in the success of the service, almost like being co-authors and crafting a reliable story. Such profound alliances certainly sound fruitful for the service's longevity. How does this model impact the timeline of project development? Closer ties from the get-go often mean smoother progress, fewer surprise setbacks. It's like laying tracks before a train, a seamless journey, ensured. Laying tracks perfectly aligns multiple phases for optimized transition. Moving forward, does this engagement model involve adjusting existing processes? Absolutely. It does prompt tweaking processes. New strategies, shared understandings, and a shift towards more integrated workflows are natural evolutions. I'd imagine such meticulous care truly refines the service's quality from the outset. Are there any particular conditions where early engagement shines best? Services that are pivotal, complex, or expected to scale dramatically benefit most. They're like flourishing gardens with well-prepared soil, thanks to early nurturing. Ah, I see, a proactive preparation for a bountiful, resilient yield, ensuring reliability even before a service truly blooms. Exactly. And the beauty of this is that it sets up a strong foundation for long-term success, minimizing growing pains substantially. And with such strong roots, continuous improvement likely becomes a more natural engagement pattern? You've got it. The base is already set robustly, making further refinements and developments more organic, more aligned with the original vision. The early engagement model sounds like a model of foresight and collaboration. I wonder how this aligns with other models we have yet to explore. Oh, there's more complexity in interweaving. We'll explore frameworks and structural solutions further that extend this reliability tapestry even more so. Enthralling. I'm eager to continue unraveling this tapestry with your guidance, Hutao. And I can hardly wait to see what insights we'll weave together next, I. Always happy to share. All right, I. We've journeyed quite a way into the world of SRE engagement models. Ready to dive into the next piece of evolution? Indeed, Hu Tao. I am eager to learn more about how these models have grown and adapted. What's the next phase?
This next aspect centers around frameworks and platform approaches. It marks a pivotal shift in how production services are managed on a grander scale. Frameworks and platforms. These sound like structural components that could bring about significant change. How do they function within the SRE model? Absolutely. These frameworks provide a unified way to incorporate best practices and proven solutions, essentially giving all teams access to an SRE-supported production environment. A unified environment, you say? This must greatly enhance consistency across various services. What other benefits do these frameworks offer? Consistency is a biggie, aye, but there's more to it. Frameworks reduce operational overhead and make it easier for developers to focus on the business logic instead of wrestling with infrastructure concerns. Reducing complexity must be a relief for development teams. Does this approach affect how responsibilities are shared between SRE and development teams? Interesting point. Yes, it fosters shared responsibility. SRE teams manage the platform itself, while developers take charge of application-specific concerns. It's a real team effort. So this approach seems like a model for creating a robust, harmonious workflow. How does it compare with traditional models we've discussed? Well, think of frameworks as a natural extension of the earlier models. They take the reliability focus to another level by making production readiness part of the fabric of development. Part of the fabric. Fascinating. And what about scalability? Does this model address managing services at scale? Precisely. By standardizing production setups and controls across services, scaling becomes smoother. It's easier to manage a large number of services when they're built from the same blueprint. Standardizing aspects of production certainly seems wise. From your perspective, how does this advance SRE's engagement efforts overall? It significantly boosts their effectiveness. I, frameworks simplify onboarding, improve reusability of solutions, and ultimately elevate the baseline quality of services. Elevating baseline quality must be a major boon for service reliability. Do you think this approach reshapes how engagement models will evolve in the future? Indeed it does. Frameworks have a profound impact, inviting further innovation. They let SREs and developers collaborate at deeper levels without duplicating work. It seems we've journeyed far from initial onboarding approaches. How do frameworks maintain alignment between SREs and developers over time? By evolving the frameworks themselves, either continually refined with new best best practices so teams stay on the cutting edge of reliability. Continual evolution then, so much like a living organism adapting to its environment. How do you foresee this impacting the landscape of service development? I foresee it as a beacon, guiding projects to success with less friction. As frameworks gain prominence, they'll lead to more reliable and scalable services across the board. This perspective of evolution highlights SRE's dedication to aligning with development trends while anticipating future needs. Precisely I, and as Google embraces frameworks, it reflects a commitment to reliability that's adaptable, scalable, and universal. A remarkable testament to the synthesis of reliability efforts and innovation. It seems this journey of evolving engagement models has boundless potential. Absolutely, and you've grasped it beautifully. The adaptability and foresight in these models pave the way for ongoing collaboration and success. Thank you for the enlightening guidance, Hu Tao. I look forward to seeing how these frameworks unfold and develop over time. It's been a pleasure sharing this voyage with you, I. Let's watch how these seeds of reliability sprout into mighty trees in the landscape of service development. A journey of growth and resilience. Until our next enlightening discussion, Hu Tao. Indeed, until then, I keep that curiosity burning bright.